Hello, welcome to the Faith is Not Blind podcast. I'm Sarah Devonier, and I'm here with my friend Jessica. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I'm glad to have you here. If you could just start off by talking about your childhood and how you were introduced to the concept of faith and to the church. Okay. Um, well, I grew up in the church. My parents were members, and um, so it's all I've ever known. Um, they were very active. We um, went to all of our activities. We went to church weekly. They um, went to the temple regularly. So it was a it was a very immersed childhood in the gospel. Um, and we held family home evening regularly. I'm um, four of five kids, so um, they were very committed, and I felt very committed as a child. So um, I don't know. That's uh, yeah. yeah. That's how it went for me, and I felt like from a very young age, I I started building a testimony. When would you say you recognized that? you had a personal testimony. Was there an experience when you were young where you felt like it wasn't just your parents and their commitment, but where you recognized that your commitment was starting to grow as an individual? Um, that's an interesting question for me because I've thought about that and I've, I've kind of felt like there hasn't been any one specific thing, that it's been a very gradual and like, like I've had experiences, but I haven't ever been able to say that's when I knew. Right. I felt like um, being baptized and then going to young women's and having um, spiritual discussions as a family, just they all built on top right. of each other to the point where it was like, I can't remember not knowing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but I just no, I can't make, pinpoint yeah. that point. Well, it makes sense. I th I think sometimes in the church we feel like we have to have that experience where we know and we can we can talk about it. And I I'm glad that you said that because I I'd like to pursue that a little bit actually. When did you realize that that was okay to have a cumulative testimony. We, we tend to think that we need this big dramatic experience. How did you know that that, that kind of cumulative, gradual, growing testimony was a testimony? Because I think sometimes some people don't know that. Um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know that I ever questioned that. I guess I never felt like I needed a um, Joseph Smith experience to have a testimony. And maybe it's because of the way that my leaders, um, especially as a youth in, in young women's taught me, but I never felt like I needed something extreme in order yeah. to have a testimony. And so I was able to just kind of roll with it and be okay with it. And it's interesting because I, I don't think I ever thought of that side of what you just stated of needing to have a, a, a right. big event until my husband and I were talking not that long ago. And he said, that's how one of my friends was. He had such a hard time. He, they went on the back east trip. I think it's because we were talking about me going back east on a senior trip. And, and he said, yeah, I had a friend who he thought there was something wrong with him because he wasn't having this major spiritual, yeah. like lightning striking experience in the sacred grove. And everyone else was like, this is amazing. I, I know, you know, and, and he felt like there was something wrong. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I've never thought, I've never thought in my lifetime that I've, that I haven't had a testimony because I haven't had anything extreme. Um, but I know that I have a testimony because of my spiritual experiences and because of that um, conviction that I can't deny. So I, I, I don't know if I'm answering the question well, no, but, it's beautiful. but it, 
I, it just never occurred to me that I might not have a true testimony because I hadn't had a major experience. Well, and you, you defined your testimony yourself. Yeah. And I think that's important that it's, that it's yours mm -hmm. and whatever that looks like, looks like you and how you feel that it's true. As you started to grow older, um, were there times when people close to you questioned your beliefs and what did you do about that? Did it sort of echo some of the similar experiences you had had when you were younger? Um, yeah, I've, I've had friends who have left the church. I've had family members who have left the church and um, it was interesting because a lot of my immediate family and even my husband had a, a very angry reaction to it. Like, and I'm sure that was stemmed from fear for the unknown um, for the said family members. Um, I, for me, as they, as they left, it, it did cause me to think, well, what, I mean, is there something I haven't thought deeply enough about? Or like, do I real? can I really say that this is the one and only, this is the church, this is where I need to be? Um, you know, so it caused questions in my own mind. Um, but as I thought about it, I always came back to that conviction of, I, I know that Heavenly Father loves me, and I know that Jesus Christ loves me, and I love them. And even though I don't know all of the answers, I can say that I know that living the life I'm living is the one I want to live. And so I never felt angry towards them in, I, in feeling like, well, you're doing all of the wrong things, and what about your children, and, <laughs> and how dare you, or s want to just be lazy, or you were deceived, or <laughs> like, uh, just all of the statements that can come in a hard family relationship like that just didn't make sense to me. And so because I knew that the ultimate um, reason for me for being in the church was the love of God and of yeah. Jesus Christ, that's what I should be showing to them. And that because they might have left the church doesn't mean that God loves them less. Oh, I love that. So, sorry, I'm well, emotional. I, I, well, I think the emotion comes from love, right? Yeah. Lo love for those people. I'm thinking of the scripture that says, perfect love casteth out fear. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, that, that anger and frustration is probably coming from fear. Mm -hmm. Fear that maybe, you know, what, what I believe isn't true or fear for them, but that love for you cast, cast that out. Mm -hmm. And that kind of fear probably wouldn't help them. Yeah. And I felt like the, the correct response for them from any member of the church is, we love you. Um, we respect your free agency. We respect your ability to choose for your life. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that you're my sibling and I love you and we're going to continue a relationship. And so that's just where I've always tried to come from. If, if there are people who are going through similar experiences to your siblings, how would you tell them to find that love if, if they're not feeling it? Um, I think it can be hard because both sides um, can be really polarized. The people who are in the church can feel like, no, this is the one and only, it's the end of the world if you leave. And the people who are leaving the church can feel like, I don't even want to hear anything that you have to say because you're so one-minded that yeah. I have to be so one-minded um, and so 
extreme the opposite way that there's not even a place for me because you guys say there's not a place. Um, and I think that for someone struggling to feel loved is because of probably that polarization. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think being able to try to be a little bit open to saying, I understand where you're coming from. I understand that the gospel is your, is your center and, and that fear and that maybe anger or feeling of like, like you want to reject me. Being able to understand that mm. in the other side might maybe help them open up a little bit more to saying, I just want a relationship. I just want to be loved. And I don't know if that's the right answer or if, that, if that's helpful at all, but trying not to be too extreme as you struggle in pushing everyone away yeah, might be, I don't know. Well, a I, way to you described it as being one-minded rather than open-minded. Yeah. And it is hard to be open-minded when we're talking about truth. Yes. Um, so on the other end of it, when, when, when you have, because I imagine it was a process to get to this point for, for you to be accepting and loving. Mm -hmm. How do you help yourself react in a loving way when you, when you do get frustrated? What do you do so that you feel like you can still have your beliefs, but you can still be loving to them? What, what helps you do that? Well, um, setting a little bit of a boundary with my siblings. I, when, when they first let us know that they were leaving, I just said, I love you. I respect your ability to choose. Um, and I, I, I want you to respect mine. And I want us both to be able to continue a relationship. So please don't offer information. If I want to, if I want mm. information, I'll ask you for it. So just like setting up those boundaries has really set us up for a relationship where we don't have to question where, are they going to say something to us that's going to make us go, oh, cover our children's ears? Or are, are, are we going to do something that's going to offend them? It kind of opened up this, this I'll respect you if you can respect me. And then I, I haven't really struggled with it mm -hmm. since then. I haven't had to feel frustration towards them. I've only felt love and wanting to understand them. And I think that it's giving them the ability to feel like, I don't have to worry about them. They're not going to try to come in and save us. They're not, it, we can just have a relationship. And so we just kind of set that up. We're free to let you believe what you want. We'll believe what, what we feel yeah. our So you set boundaries on the information shared, but not on the love yes. shared. Yes. And, and you don't, you don't, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Yes. You, you can share love, even if you're, you do set boundaries just on the information. Yeah. So you have how many kids? I have three. And so just, this will be the last question, but how do you teach your kids maybe differently because of your experiences with your siblings? Um, well, we've had to kind of teach them that we all have different um, views, that it's okay that there are people in our lives that are immediate in our lives that maybe don't believe everything the same as we do. Um, but we love them. They love their cousins from this family. They love them. They are thrilled to play with them. And so it's, I, I've tried to teach them that, um, sorry, that belief and um, the way that someone else thinks that might be different than you doesn't change their value. Oh. And they, and they love them and, and they don't know that there's a difference really. And I think that's what's important when we look at people around us is seeing their value. Well, and I think you give them the opportunity to see that our value in God's eyes doesn't change based on what we believe either. And so that they can see 
God loves their cousins just as he mm-hmm. mu- as much as he loves them and they can love their cousins just as much as you do. Yeah. And what a, what a great example of letting just like when you were a child you you didn't try and control or manipulate your testimony. Mm-hmm. You you let it flow to you naturally and it, and it seems like you do that with love for other people mm-hmm. and it it's a, a beautiful Thank thing. You. I I appreciate you sharing it. Thank you so much. Thank you.